Um, we are really lucky this morning to have uh, Corey Waller here. Um, Corey, Corey has uh, uh, been in a career involving emergency medicine, uh, pain medicine, and many other things, and uh, amongst um, them is, a, again, addiction medicine. And he really wants to uh, keep this idea going about trauma and the role that that plays in uh, the development of these chronic pain syndromes and the difficulty that people have um, trying to navigate the healthcare ecosystem when they have all of these things that have happened during um, early parts of their life. He uh, has been a part of the Camden Coalition, which I think I mentioned um, was highlighted in Atul Gawande's article in The New Yorker called The Hot Spotters. We're going to be learning a lot about what they have gained from the experience of working in that really challenged community, urban, very deeply um, poverty-stricken uh, part of the country. And um, I think there's some great things that you will be able to gain from his perspectives on um, what's happening here. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Corey take the uh, podium here. All right, good morning. Excellent. Uh, so first, I, I want to thank Dan and uh, uh, everyone getting me here, because I grew up here. So I, I was born in Dallas, raised in Austin, went to high school here, made a lot of mistakes here, had a lot of fun, um, enjoyed Sixth Street both as a uh, participant and uh, I was a bar manager and um, at, a, at a place called the library, which is funny, because it really didn't feel like the library I figured out in medical school. And I. Uh, as I look around, I, uh, I realize that the way in which Texas has moved forward in healthcare is not necessarily the way in which I've seen it move forward in other places. And so it's fun to kind of come back and hear all of the, the, the people doing really hard work on a daily basis in this area and the, uh, the movement that has been taking place in the uh, kind of the dark zones of, uh, of healthcare at this point. And it is ready to, I think, move to that next level. I need to kind of understand the audience so that I can make sure and level set with the vernacular um, when we talk about trauma and what I call the sentinel syndromes that we'll walk through. But how many people here are clinicians? How many are administrators? Great. All right. So about half and half. So, all right. So we'll walk, the, uh, we'll walk that line. Um, you know, I've been really lucky in my career. I started off in emergency medicine, trained in Philly, uh, went and worked in Michigan. Uh, hated my job immediately after three months, uh, which is a, a bummer, right? You train all this time to go be something, and then you realize this is horrible. What did I do? Um, and I found out that I didn't like my job in the emergency department, not because I didn't know what to do for trauma or a heart attack, or I had done more thoracotomies in Philadelphia than my chief of trauma in Michigan, where I started. Um, so I felt prepared for those things. But what I wasn't prepared for was the suffering, the frustration, the sadness. Um, the pain that patients felt, and that, that pain really is not just about physical pain. It's not the spinothalamic tract problem. Um, it's the spinomesencephalic tract problem, which is the, the tract that not only um, parallels the tract that tells us I have pain in what location, but this one takes a detour and starts to move into areas of the brain like the amygdala and the reward system and the prefrontal cortex. And so that is how we emotionally react to pain. And I, like everyone else, and I heard yesterday, we all are okay, we all understand we didn't get good training in pain, right? We all had less than an hour of training, and in emergency medicine, mine was directed at how much hydromorphone I can give somebody before they stop breathing, and we didn't really care that much because, you know, I could intubate you if I messed up. So it was not that big of a deal. But we never got training in addiction, and we definitely didn't get training in suffering. And so I got frustrated with work and then opened a clinic dedicated to those patients that frustrated me and, uh, and saw patients that were in the ER 10 or more times per year and, and then pe pregnant on a controlled substance. So those were the two cohorts of patients I saw for about five years in Michigan. And during that time, I met Jeff Brenner, who had started the Camden Coalition and done this hotspotters work. And we had worked in parallel but didn't know each other. And once we kind of got together, we found that we had a lot in common and we had really approached this problem from two different angles that overlapped in a number of fashions. So I took an 18, I'm just finished an 18 month time frame at the Camden Coalition, which is also the National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs. And during that time, 
I got to go around the, the country and I saw, I've seen well over 150 health systems, FQHCs, um, you know, hospitals that are in the rural area, urban area, and not only what we've done in Camden, but kind of really gotten to the bottom of, in my mind, cause and effect. Like, why are we seeing the problems that we're seeing? And so what I want to present to you is kind of those lessons that I've learned and how I'm trying to consolidate those thoughts. So before we get to the first slide, I want everybody here to picture two, two mountains. I want you to picture El Capitan, which is like super jagged and up and down, um, but it still has trees and roots and things that hold that mountain in place. And then I want you to think about uh, the rolling hills of the hill country, right? So not terribly steep, you know, but they're still, they're still there. And that also has, uh, while not lush forest on it, you know, it, it has mesquite trees all over it, so it holds it together. And, and then I want you to imagine um, those being our genetic predisposition. This is where we start. Some people have a risk of a steep cliff, and some people have pretty good genetics, and they're lucky, and they, don't, they really start with a good shot. But if there's a fire on either of those, and we clear all of that brush, and we take away all that stability, it doesn't matter if you have a slow rolling hill or if you have a steep grade. The rate at which the mudslide happens is the only difference. But the mudslide will happen. And so if you add early life trauma to someone, even if they have good genetics, you have taken away their capability to buffer any rain that comes along. And so as we start to think about what this looks like, we need to start looking at how this starts. So we have the genetic predisposition, and now we're knowing a lot more about inherited epigenetic effects. So we used to think that epigenetics, which is our reaction to the world around us and how our body quickly adapts within hours many times, is, is something that doesn't get passed on. But there's research now that shows that you can pass on inherited epigenetic effects from generation to generation, down five generations. So this was work done at Mount Sinai, which was really interesting, where they took two, um, uh, two mouse models, and these mouse models were bred to have no genetic risk for addiction. No genetic risk. And, but they exposed them to uh, the drug over and over and over again to the point at which they exhibited the behaviors of addiction. And so they induced, ultimately, addiction in these rats who had no, no genetic predisposition for this. And then they bred that rat that, that they had turned, basically, into an addicted rat with one that wasn't, again, not genetically predisposed. So they were both genetically not uh, predisposed. And they stopped all uh, drugs before they uh, copulated, which, you know, I'm not sure if that's your thesis of rat copulation and how that works. But in, in the end, they did this, and then the next generation acted just like a rat with a genetic risk for addiction. Even though no genetic risk, bred with no genetic risk, we induced that risk when somebody became addicted to, and specifically that rat became addicted to fentanyl is what they used. And I would say that that's probably uh, wide over all of opioids. And that went down five generations. So they found for five generations it did not clear that risk. So it's not just a matter of what you were born with, it's what happens during that lifetime that can now get pushed over to you. So thinking about the inherited epigenetic changes is really important. But no matter again what that is, we have this whole situation of early life trauma. And we've talked about adverse childhood events and, and what that looks like, and we're gonna dig into that at the end of the lecture, but I just wanna introduce that. Without early life trauma, even a really steep hill, even really rough, scary genetics can hold together. They can push through. They're the people, they're that one in a million who gets out of the hood, right? So when I'm down in uh, Camden and walk, and I've done basically street medicine in Camden where you go down and, uh, and you're finding patients there under the bridges and homeless populations and those that just stay out of the healthcare system, which is funny, right, because I'm always told I look like a cop and, um, and, and that doesn't go over well when I'm wandering the streets of Camden. Uh, so I, I had a t-shirt that said, I'm not the popo, and, uh, and I, I would literally just walk down in the streets and, and it worked out. And they all got to know me over time, but what I found is that they would all talk of that one person who got out. You know, that one, they all had the same story of the one person who made it out of that situation. And I'll tell you, it wasn't hard work. It wasn't the fact that they, uh, they were the only one who put their nose to the grindstone and figured out how to do this. They were the only one who didn't get their ass kicked as a kid. They were the only one whose parents were around. They were the only one who did not have that traumatic event happen over and over again to create the pathology that we see for behavior. And so for them, 
their genetic cliff still was lush with trees. It, it didn't matter how steep or how shallow it was, it was still intact, and so they had a buffer. They had that emotional buffer that allowed them to interact with the people around them, and they had this uh, capability to move through with resilience um, despite um, little bumps in the road because they never had that massive early traumatic bump. So if you have that buffer, you will make it, but the vast majority of people, especially in generational poverty, and whether that is um, you know, a single wide mobile home in the middle of a rural area, or if that is in a dense urban area, that generational poverty sets in as its own level of trauma and fear. Am I gonna eat tomorrow? Am I gonna have a place to stay that's safe tomorrow? When that door closes from the car that pulls up in the driveway, is dad gonna be drunk and come in and light me up? Those are, those are things that people have to think about as we go through, and this is what we end up with. And as we see this decreased buffer, that also means that these patients don't have safety. They don't ever feel safe. And if we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they live on that bottom rung, right? And if you're not safe, you don't care about anything else. You don't care that you have a medical appointment at 11.30 a.m. You don't. It's not on your radar. What you care about is this morning, am I going to survive? Am I going to be safe in the place that I am? And can I escape for a minute so that I can get food? Maybe just a little bit of shelter. It's 45 and raining. And in Austin, that might as well be the dead of winter, right? You know, there are people out huddled in igloos trying to, you know, put fire together. And, and so here, I mean, people will have catastrophic bad outcomes at 45 degrees and raining. I, mean, I, I worked at Seton Hospital here, not the new one, but the, uh, uh, the old one. And, uh, and we had in these situations people who showed up and they, uh, they would be hypothermic, I mean, from this, and they would get that. And so they're worried about that. They're not worried about, am I going to show up for my follow-up appointment that took two months to schedule that, you know, they don't have the, uh, the app that the alarm goes off on the phone and reminds them a day before and then 30 minutes before. They're, they're supposed to just somehow remember this from the trash bag that they're dragging behind them. That, that just doesn't happen. So the other piece that's really important that I think we underestimate is this lack of authentic healing relationships, meaning a relationship that creates that safety for you, the ability to feel comfortable with someone enough to have a discussion about the things that scare you and worry you and that. And so it's, is anybody here remember the old uh, psychology experiment where they took uh, rhesus monkeys and you either got a carpet mommy um, or a wire mommy. And I just remember those videos stuck in my brain from college where you basically have this rhesus monkey clinging to the wire mommy and it had all of this, you know, it would bounce around and it couldn't focus and it would be like angry and it would fight back at the people at the lab. Whereas the one with the carpet mommy um, was okay. And it felt like it had that often more something softer in a, in a very literal sense, but it's no different in the figurative sense when we start to look at how people exist in the world around them. So when we have this, this genetic predisposition, whether it's good or bad, that's clear cut by a fire, and all of a sudden we have no buffer, we have no authentic healing relationships, we've lost the capability for safety, that increases the risk of what I found to be the leading cause of most of the stuff we see, which is what I call the sentinel syndromes. And so these are the four syndromes that I found uh, that are ubiquitous, uh, specifically amongst the 5% of patients that cost 50% of healthcare dollars. And it is addiction, it are, it's untreated mental health conditions, it is chronic pain, and it is cognitive disorders. This one I didn't understand early, but the cognitive disorders comprises a group of um, low IQ on the spectrum, or somebody with a traumatic brain injury um, who has a cognitive dysfunction secondary to that, which oddly enough, we're seeing a lot more of that, especially within the VA population. And that cognitive dysfunction takes away a lot of the buffer that they have, but also starts to really impede their ability to take on new information. And so when we get frustrated, my therapy is not working, and we sat there and they went through, they're like, I've gone to therapy forever, it doesn't do anything for me. They're probably right, because trying to understand the concept of cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy, if you're cognitively disordered, it's just not going to work. And so we have to recognize that early and figure out how we intervene early if we're ever going to stabilize that patient. But they kind of live in the ether over here, and we don't even check for those things. We just say, ah, I gave her some written discharge instructions from the emergency department at 3 o'clock in the morning, so she obviously knows she should follow up in three days with her primary care doctor and take this medicine exactly as prescribed with an IQ of 74. And that, that just doesn't work. Those things don't match. And so we wonder why this is. And these, uh, these syndromes uh, really do drive everything else that comes on because if you have 
a, any of these, addiction, mental health, chronic pain, cognitive impairment, then that increases your risk for homelessness and incarceration. Because if you have these and they're untreated, eventually you can't keep a job. Eventually you can't get income. And eventually people around you give up on trying to give you stability, whether that be through money or housing or safety. And when that happens, it increases the risk of being homeless, which increases the risk of being arrested just for standing in the wrong place. And then that increases the risk of being incarcerated. And if you're incarcerated, that usually means that somebody has slapped you with a felony or two. And generally, they'll get the uh, habitual felony offense, which happens after you get arrested a few times, and they'll call you a habitual criminal. And at that point, you have two, maybe three felonies on your record, and so there is no felony abatement. At that point, you're done. You can't get a job, you can't get loans, you can't get an education. In some states, you can't even frickin' vote. I mean, we literally, for somebody being basically homeless and mentally ill, we take away their citizenship. And we do this willingly, and we think we're teaching them a lesson. Uh, this is a, a bit, the more I've dug into this, the more ultimately disgusted I have become by the way in which we treat these patients because we have not understood the cause. And we, we create, you know, what I call this fundamental attribution error. When we attribute the behavior of a patient to themselves in a personal decision rather than to the situation in which they're in. And if we were to remove them from that situation, then what we would have is a person who would have the same capability as the vast majority of us if it hadn't been for that early life trauma, that homelessness, followed by incarceration and felonious, whatever they want to call it. And, and when that happens, this has now set us up for all of these things that we see in the healthcare system, right? We see inconsistent transportation. We see unpredictable communication. Can I get a hold of them? They're not answering my phone call, which is why telephonic uh, case management is, a, is just hysterical to me. You know, when you're trying to call, it's not like my guy under the bridge is like, hold on, I have a call from my caseworker. Let me, uh, let, me, let me chat with him for a second, figure out what's up. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to get a little gas right here, and I, I'm, I'm getting in a knife fight in just a second. So if you can hold on. It, it just, that doesn't occur. It just, uh, this is, these are issues that we get frustrated with. But then it leads to this kind of this lack of coordination. I mean, we've structurally built in all the reasons in the world for lack of coordination of care, even if you have everything going on properly. Like if you have a, a mental health situation, you see a psychiatrist and, they, uh, and you have to go and see them, that medical record doesn't talk with this medical record. And if you're being seen for a substance use disorder, we now have, you know, I've always since 86 have had 42 CFR part two, which then sequesters the information, the protected health information for addiction, even from psychiatry and even from the hospital. So now we have all of these disconnected pieces of information and we have no idea what's going on. And so we've structurally built that in on purpose. And in fact, most states have an extra layer of protection on this information, even over and above 42 CFR Part 2. So, so we have created this disconnected world, and we call it protection, but this protection creates death. And as an emergency medicine doctor, and I still clinically work in the emergency department, if I don't know a patient is on methadone, if I don't know a patient is being treated for an alcohol use disorder or any of these things, I could start with a prescription of medication that seems perfectly harmless, but kills them. How many people in here have killed a patient? Right? If you're a clinician, raise your hand. <laughs> right? Just be honest. And I, the problem is, we, don't, we mostly don't know when that happens. We want to blame it on uh, a side effect of a medication. We want to blame it on uh, they didn't follow up with their last appointment. We want to blame it on AMA. You know, they left against medical advice. But the reality is, is there are a lot of things we could have done to circumvent that. But I have one patient that sticks with me really significantly. And I'm board certified in addiction medicine. Um, I've written guidelines for treatment of opioid use disorder for the state of Michigan. And, uh, and, you know, have built policy around this. And I'm working in an emergency department a few years ago. I had a patient come in, did not know they were on methadone. They had an ankle fracture. And, uh, and they didn't say, I even asked, you know, any other things? Do you have any issues with uh, um, addiction, you know, in the last six months? Have you ever been treated for this? I, I, I go in a pretty deep dive screening process for myself. I looked at the PDMP. Nothing. I looked here, everything seemed clean. They had a fractured ankle. I wrote them for opioids, and they were having I actually spasm in their lower leg that I felt. So I wrote them for four cyclobenzaprine, and, uh, and I wrote them for three days of medication before anything ever came up about narrowing down. Well, they went home and took all of those on top of their methadone the next day and died. 
because they were going to lose their job because they broke their ankle and they didn't have the capability to do it. So I killed that patient. That was me. But I killed him because I didn't have information that I would have wanted to see. Like, I don't even know they were in a methadone class. I can't even look to see if they were in an opioid treatment program. Because that would have been a completely different pathway. I was so angry. I'm still, obviously, you can tell probably very angry about this because this was preventable. This was a 26-year-old, you know, with a kid. I mean, this is ridiculous that this stuff happens. Um, but without this information, no matter how much you ask, we have structurally built problems into this. And if we have all of this inconsistent transportation, unpredictable communication, and a lack of care coordination, what does that lead to? It leads to our favorite things to talk about, which are diseases. It leads to diabetes and COPD, hypertension, CHF, poorly controlled sickle cell, bad prenatal care, morbid obesity. You know, we, we talk about these like they are the cause. These are not the cause, these are the effect. And so if every program that we've built that's been federally funded around diabetic management. Um, in San Antonio, I remember when I was in medical school, uh, we had built a brand new diabetes hospital uh, down, you know, right downtown. And it, all it was was basically a massive hospital dedicated to the treatment of the endocrinological disorder of diabetes. That's neat. And that's, it was really pretty. I mean, we got to go and rotate there, and it had really, really nice fireplace in Texas, like, you know, fireplace. And then, you know, all of this stuff that I would see, but what they didn't do was look at any of the social correlates and social determinants of health that these patients had, and definitely didn't look at trauma. So when was the first time that trauma came out in the literature? I mean, like, hardcore neurobiology of trauma. 95, it came out in a pretty big way. Where was that work done? Anybody know? Baylor. Baylor College of Medicine put out in an adolescent neuro, neuroscience journal a review of the neurobiological changes of early life trauma and stress. This is way before we talked about um, the ACEs studies or anything like this. They had seen it, they talked about it, they knew about it, and it had been in the ether enough to actually come out as a review article. Not a, not a first like thought you know, provoking article, but pulling that together. So, and this was, I think, Perry uh, was the author of this. And, um, and so we've known for a long time how, how trauma plays in to the development of the disordered thinking and disordered uh, reality of life that leads to these diseases. Because no matter how many nutritional courses we give a patient with diabetes, if they have untreated addiction, it's not going to get better, right? You can't be like, you know, I have, a, I have a new nutritionist. This may be good. You sit down, we're going to learn how to count those you know, you know, carbohydrate calories so that we know how to give your ultra short acting insulin. And uh, that's just not going to work when they're like, uh, I'm starting in withdrawal now, so I'm going to go outside and I'm going to hit a bag of heroin in the parking lot so that I don't have profound withdrawal. I mean, that's what we're dealing with at this point. And now that we understand that addiction is not a, um, a decisional problem, it literally has changed the, the neurochemistry of the reward system to the point where the drug has now replaced all natural reward pathways, and it seems just as logical to use heroin as it does to hug your kid. And the brain sees it that way, and it feels that way. And so when we do this, it is not a decisional pathway, because I will tell you, nobody decides on their genetics. Nobody really decides on their epigenetics. Nobody decides on their trauma. And then as we start to go down this pathway, um, nobody wants to wake up in the morning homeless, shooting heroin every day. I have yet to meet an addicted patient that I have treated that said, you know, I woke up one morning, I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a heroin addict, because that looks sweet. You know, I watched train spotting and I was like, that was awesome. I'm in. <laughs> it did not happen that way. It is a catastrophic, you know, reality of a, like a boulder falling down a hill. It is this avalanche effect of reality that hits these patients. And as that happens, they end up with these things. And this is where we see them. We see them with poorly controlled COPD. We see them with poorly controlled CHF. We see them with, you know, diabetes and asthma and sickle cell over and over. And what we want to do is treat that. But what we are doing in that setting is treating the effect and not the cause. Which brings me back to the ultimate cause. Because if we look at this, we're slowly climbing up the ladder, right? If we were to look at the whole picture, we're slowly climbing up the ladder of healthcare used to only focus on diabetes and COPD. But now we're like, wow, we should figure out how to get rides for our patients. And maybe we should figure out how to communicate with them. So we've given them phone. We've added, you know, minutes to the phone. We're like, they need a care coordinator. So we have community health workers that we've sent out uh, to the community. These are all good things. But then we climb up a little bit, and now we're talking about, man, maybe if we just give them shelter, it could be okay. You know, we could do this. 
And then, well, maybe if we redo our, you know, our uh, system and the DOJ comes out and says, you know what we need to do is treat people for their addiction and not incarcerate them for their disease. Maybe we should treat their um, hypomania rather than incarcerate them for that. Um, well, they started to say that and then things got a little weird. But, the, uh, but in the end, we're starting to move there. And when we do that, we're still not attacking the pieces of the house of medicine that don't exist. These are areas that do not exist in the, in the standard house of medicine. Less than 15, we did this call, we called 500 hospitals to find out if they had medical staff privileges for addiction medicine. If they even had the ability for an addiction medicine doctor to get on staff as that being their specialty. And less than 15% of hospitals that we called actually had medical staff privileges for addiction medicine. They all had it for cardiology. They all had it for anesthesiology, endocrinology, pulmonology, all the other ologies had their own little pathway of I'm an ology doctor here, except for addictionology. There was none of that. Like I couldn't get on staff at Cooper University Hospital in New Jersey, in Camden, New Jersey, a place where I trained as a, in trauma. Um, from Jefferson, we would rotate over there because that's where we saw all of the knife and gun you know, shots and everything. And so when we did that, I still, when I got there, I was like, hey, I'd like to get on your staff as an addiction medicine doctor. And they were like, oh, we don't really have that pathway. What else do you do? And I was like, well, what about, I could do, we do pain, we could do, what do you want? I couldn't do emergency medicine because you have to work for them in the ER to actually be emergency medicine. So for me to actually, the only reason I could get on staff is for pain medicine. So, so when we look at this, I mean, we're structurally, again, built out the capability to not do well for our patients. But I want to deep dive a little bit into this uh, early life trauma. So we've talked about, I had a great conversation last night that brought up the reality that we have a couple of different versions of trauma, one of which we've figured out screening tools for. And we can test and we see all the neurobiological changes and we see the, uh, the, the couple of changes that happen, the structural changes and the entropic changes, entropy. So entropy is the way that they look at uh, standard baseline activity in the brain. And, uh, and you look at that through functional MRIs and you can see how um, energy moves in the brain. Is it increased, decreased, or the same? And so that's the level of entropy that a patient has. And as you have disordered thinking, you have increased entropy or increased chaos in the movement of energy through the brain that we can see on the functional MRI. So increased entropy in that setting ultimately equals uh, dysfunctional thought. And that dysfunctional thought equals dysfunctional behavior. So every trauma patient that I've seen, I recognize trauma not based on the fact that I did an ACEs screen, but based on the fact that they had a personality disorder. Personality disorders are just a manifestation of trauma. And so the borderline personality disorder patient who comes in is not wanting to create chaos just for fun. They're wanting to create chaos to feel safe. Because if we walk through that person's life early and you have maybe one parent, maybe not, um, who is uh, creating that early life trauma, who is uh, making really unstable housing there. They don't know if they're gonna sleep here, maybe on the couch, or have to go to the sister's house, or have to do these things. Um, living in that chaos requires the brain to change. It requires it to update its wiring. And as it does that, you start to optimize the brain to live in that chaos. So when we take a person out of that chaos and we try to put them in order, they don't like it. Their brain is not built for being in an ordered society. So they have to rewire that brain to make it fit into what we would call normal. And in order to do that, they fight so hard to make chaos. Has anybody seen uh, one of these patients where they come into a clinic and they will utterly destroy the clinic? Like they have doctors and um, you know, medical assistants and nurses fighting with each other. They have providers yelling at each other and they're loving it. They're sitting right in the middle, and to them, that's like, oh, this feels like home. I mean, that's, that's the way that they ultimately feel. That's what they were raised in, is that chaos, and they have rewired to do that. Somebody with generalized anxiety disorder with panic. If you think about somebody with early life trauma there, you have the kid who grew up in a house that every time dad came home, they would get the crap kicked out of him if something wasn't right. If there was like a little something wrong in the house, if it was dirty, if, if they were just standing in the wrong place, it didn't matter. So every time that they heard the car you know, pull into the garage, they would get anxious. And that anxiety would help them to realize they needed to do this and do this to be safe. And then over time, that anxiety got to the point where they could hear the car down the street. 
They knew exactly what dad's car sounded like. And then they would start to panic. Oh my God, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, I didn't do this. It, and then that would actually become a safety net for them. But the minute you remove them out of that, it's all of a sudden pathology. So we've taken something that was very protective and then we see it as pathology. But if you go back to the neurobiology of the adverse childhood events and how that actually changed the way that they perceive the world around them and then to create the neurobiology of survival in that setting, then it makes a lot of sense. And it also makes a lot of sense why these patients may have a predisposition for things like mental illness, may have a predisposition for things like addiction. Because think about if you have all that horrible chaos and fear and those scared moments and you have a, you know, a beer and you're 12. At that moment, you're like, all right, all right, I can, I can deal with this, whatever. Yeah, and then it takes two, and then it takes five, and then it takes weed and beer, and then it takes, you know, pills, and then it takes all of the stuff that we end up with as we see a patient in early adulthood. So trauma is not some figmented imaginary thing that we see. I mean, it is the driver of all new neurobiological pathways. And those new neurobiological pathways are built to actually create some form of stability in chaos. And as they move out of that chaos into what we would want to see as a normal life, um, at that point, we have to start over. And when we have to start over, that's things like dialectical behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. And the reason they're so rigid is we have to now rewire the brain in the same rigid way that it happened in a very predictably chaotic way. We have to do it in a predictably predictable way. And as we move patients through that, that's the only time in which we're ever going to get them to care one little bit about their diabetes. They were going to care one little bit about their hypertension, is if we recognize that that chaos is what created that next sentinel syndrome. And then if we don't start treating the sentinel syndromes as just a standard part of medicine, then we're never going to get on top of this. We're always going to be chasing the next thing that we have to, the next hemoglobin A1C, the next hypertensive crisis, you know, the next uh, inhaler that we want to give a patient. And those are just things that are going to fail over and over and over again. And one piece that I've also found as I've gone through, and again, we had this conversation last night, which was interesting, is the secondary trauma that happens to the adults that then treat these patients. How many people in here have uh, criked a patient? How many people in here have cut a chest open? How many people in here have seen people die in front of them and felt powerless to change that? How many people in here have uh, walked the streets and seen horrific things um, you know, with, uh, with their patients or the communities in which they live? And, and how many people still live in those communities? I mean, everybody who worked for us at Camden, um, there are outreach workers, they lived in the community in which they worked, which we were like, that's awesome, they know them and they can do this, but you know what? They treat people's trauma all day and then they go home to their own. And so it never stops. It is perpetual over and over again. And this secondary trauma I'm finding is probably the main reason that most of us in healthcare hate our jobs. It is because we see this over and over and over again. And we're now starting to rewire our brain to fit the narrative of chaos that is the clinical daily reality. And so we are turning ourselves into our own cluster B personality disorder over time. And we may want to call it ego. We may want to call it just an asshole. We may want to go down whatever pathway, but at the same time, if you really dig in, what I'm finding with the caregivers of, of patients, people who probably started off really caring, they have manipulated the neurochemistry, or it has been manipulated independent of them, um, to fit the daily reality of that trauma that's happening over and over again. And they might not be beaten. They might not be uh, sexually assaulted. They might not be neglected. But at the same time, they have to take everybody else's story and hold that. The therapists who see these patients over and over again, um, there's a reason that people who see these patients or work in addiction or work in uh, behavioral health for a long time seem like the, the odd ducks that we are. And it is because we have to hold all of these other people's lack of safety, lack of buffer, all of that early life trauma, and we have to turn around with a smile and say it's gonna be okay. So as we start to look at solutions to, to this and thinking about trauma, it's not just the adverse childhood events. It's also the secondary trauma of the caregivers who are delivering this care on a regular basis because it is a small few that actually consistently see these patients. And if we don't come up with systems that are trauma-informed, not only for the patient but also for the caregiver, then we're going to continue to perpetuate this right down the hill. It's going to continue to happen.
And this is why we see higher degrees of alcoholism and drug abuse in the, in the caregivers a higher degree of mental health problems, whether it be depression or anxiety or personality disorders, whether we see um, chronic pain in these, in these patients. You know, people, normal, 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 10 years working in a psych unit, fibromyalgia. What? How did that happen? Well, I mean, I think we can track that. We can track that spinal mesencephalic track and find out that now their baseline mild back pain, which wouldn't have bothered them otherwise, now has a manipulated brain that it's coming up to. And when that happens, you now have a patient who has the inability to discern the difference between pain and suffering. And that patient could be one of us, and, and a lot of times is, and is becoming more of one of us. So as we start to move forward with how we're gonna fix the system, and that's why I think most of you guys are here. We've recognized there's a problem. We recognize that status quo is not okay. That if we don't think about how we fix the sentinel syndromes to at least stabilize the population, how to add that into our normal everyday approach to seeing a patient. Every patient that walks into an office gets screened for hypertension, even if they have it or not. I get my blood pressure tested every time, right? When I walk in and get that tested, I don't have hypertension, but they're screening for it just in case. So let's say my blood pressure was the new abnormal, 135 over 90, all right? They're gonna start me on uh, lifestyle modifications. The one modification they can't is I work in trauma all day. <laughs> you know, that, that's not something that can really get modified without appropriate therapeutic input, uh, but it's not a medicine. But even if it's higher than that and they start me on a medicine, how long does it take to see that uh, make a difference? About 20 years before you start to see a decrease in cardiac event or stroke. So, neat, in 20 years I will have a decreased risk of an issue with cardiac or stroke. That doesn't really change exactly how we have to work on a regular basis with these patients, and it definitely doesn't change what I'm gonna to do tomorrow. But if I start a patient on medication-assisted treatment for an opioid use disorder, when do we see that positive effect? That decreased risk of mortality? Same day. I don't need it, I'm good. Same day. How many people do we have to treat with a statin? before we get one person who we've decreased a hospitalizable condition. 60. 60 people for greater than 10 years in order to decrease that. How many people do we accidentally put into the, either their primary care doc or a hospital because of the side effects of a statin? One out of every 30. So for every one we help, two we've put in the hospital for evaluation for myalgias or kidney problems or things like that. What about buprenorphine? One of, the, one of the three medications that we use, whether it's methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone, um, what is the number needed to treat before we see a positive effect on mortality? 1.6. So basically less than every other person, we're, we're decreasing mortality. 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and one year. It's better than aspirin in a heart attack. That's better than a stent in a STEMI yet it's so hard to emotionally push past this. And I have to think all of the th stuff that we have that are not letting us get to the point of moving um, into evidence-based treatment for addiction or mental health, it's not as much about the structural aspects of how we bill and pay for medicine. It's as much about the secondary trauma that we've allowed us to have such a massive stigma against this disease um, that we get so angry and then that stigma turns into discrimination. And that discrimination in our mind is justified because of the massive levels of secondary trauma that we've taken on that has rewired our brain to have the medical personality disorder. And if we don't start thinking about how to move out of that and how to have trauma-informed care systems, then we're really gonna lose every time. Thank you. Thanks. So it looks like we have time for a few questions. So if anybody has any, stump the chump time is here. Bring it on. Yes, sir. First of all, that was a terrific keynote. Thank you.
It does, and, uh, and, and I'm sure, I didn't see the presentation, but I'm sure that they showed the graph that I see all the time, which is the total health care spending, and then they add in social spending, and how the difference between spending on social determinants versus medical care is what widens that difference. That when we look between countries, we, we, we see that. So we, we have a, most countries spend most of their health care dollars on social support systems. You know, on making sure that somebody has a freedom and access to care, making sure that they have the ability to get the evidence-based treatments for whatever disease it is. And um, we, we really seem to fight that pretty hard <laughs> around here. Um, so it's a cultural phenomenon in the U.S., but there are, I've visited some of these countries and dug into their health systems a little bit, and, and there are a couple of differences. If we pull out opioids, which is a man-made problem, so we created this problem here. This is what I call the, the largest iatrogenically caused conundrum in the history of healthcare. I mean, we caused this, and we can want to blame it on pharma, we can want to blame it on everybody else, but we're the ones who didn't read the literature and just wrote a script, because it fixed a problem for us. And so this is the reason that 95% of the hydrocodone in the world is taken here, still, even with all of the changes. So that's one piece. The other piece is the cultural homogeneity of most of those countries. Most of those countries are much more homogeneous than the geographies within the U.S. because we will have hyper-urban and very rural and remote um, throughout the country. And so each, each state, state to state, has its own internal culture of how they see health. Um, and there are subsets of our population that have a complete and utter distrust of healthcare providers. And we've earned that right to have nobody trust us for that population. And so when we look at what that means um, for them as compared to the others, that's, that's what, it, you know, what it looks like. And so the difference between us and the other countries is a cultural phenomenon and the way that we choose not to pay for health care. Um, and because we don't pay for it and people can rely on it, if you're a payer, and we have this thing called churn, right? So somebody's on a product and off of a product and on a product and off of a product year to year. Then the payer's got to think, well, what if I spend that $5,000, $10,000 it takes to stabilize this person, get them there, and they churn off the next year? That other person gets that benefit from a business side. Now, if all of those payers decided that when we see these patients, we will share data enough to make sure that we know that they all got this same high-intensity intervention, and it'll help each other, so when they churn, it's no big deal, those interactions haven't happened. And again, that's a structural problem because we actually, by law, don't allow that because it's antitrust law that gets in the way of us sharing what we're going to do for patient, patients because it can get to a price-setting pathway. Um, the other piece is we've seen a massive marginal compression in, uh, in healthcare over the last decade. So we've taken what was um, a pretty marginally lucrative uh, pathway where you can build out new buildings, add on new lines of service, and do that because you had that extra margin to do that. But we've seen almost a 25% marginal compression over the last two decades. And with that, most places are living at a negative one to positive 1% margin. So super thin margins from a business standpoint. So to build on all of these things requires capital. And I'm in DC all the time with my, my work with the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and when they're trying to say $30 billion, which to an individual sounds like a lot of money, unless you're Jeff Bezos, and then, it, you know, if you're, that's not a lot of money. That's like, I, I have a couple of pennies I can, I can give you to, to maybe put some Band-Aids on some patients. But structural redevelopment of a system is, is a $300 billion problem. And years, it's a decade. Um, and so this is the reason that we see the vast majority of these problems is we're unwilling to just take the hit, at least in the short term, to capitalize building a better system and we're piecemealing it. And part of that is because we're very big, states' rights, appropriately so, have a say, and, uh, but at the same time, those are things that are barriers because the states' rights that we have here in a federalist you know, system when that comes together are very different than all of these other nations. So they have less say, command and control from the top down as compared to the way that it generally works here. So there's a lot of structural stuff, and 20% of our GDP goes to defense, and no other country on the planet does that. So immediately we take, a, a, we take an amount off the top. So those are the economic structures around it that don't seem to let us do it. Uh, we can get down to the nitty gritty of, I wish we had four more hours of training in medical school on addiction. I mean, that's neat, and I love that. I love teaching, but the realities are we have massive economic structures in the way of actually fixing our healthcare system that if we ignore, it's just never gonna get better. Sure. So, yeah, so a statin is you got to, in order to get one person who has, and the specific is, um, it takes approximately 20 years to see the benefit for a statin uh, for the patient who you first started on, on average. And then uh, for those, you have to treat 60 people before you take away a hospitalizable event. 
stroke, heart attack. It takes one in 30 people to have a side effect enough to seek medical treatment from that drug, or that class of drugs. And then for um, buprenorphine or methadone, uh, we have that data. We don't have clear data on naltrexone yet, but uh, for uh, buprenorphine and methadone, for an opioid use disorder, um, for every 1.66 people you treat, um, you actually have a benefit of a decrease in mortality. And the number needed to harm, which I didn't give you, um, is about one in 170. And that harm is somebody requires a reevaluation for a side effect of the medication, not death, especially when it comes to buprenorphine. Let's hear it for Corey. Thanks.